nice uh, visual break <coughs> from the, the walls of text that we've had in the last couple of talks. Uh, so th this one is um, on, uh, on the, some of the visual effects behind Borderlands 2, which was a, a hugely successful game that came out uh, last year and, uh, and inc incorporated a, a large number of GPU accelerated effects using our physics library. So um, we're happy to have two speakers uh, at the session. Uh, one is Jim Sanders from Gearbox. He's the uh, director of visual effects and technical art there, and uh, he worked directly on Borderlands 2. And the other is Kevin Newkirk, who's a uh, technical artist on our team at NVIDIA. Uh, we have a technical art staff as well at NVIDIA who uh, assists game developers in implementing these kinds of effects. Uh, the original speaker for this talk was actually Dane Johnston uh, from NVIDIA, but he's, uh, he's fallen uh, seriously ill. He's going to be okay, but he unfortunately couldn't make it uh, to the talk. So Kevin also worked on Borderlands 2 extensively, um, so he'll be filling in for Dane. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to the guys. Thanks. Mike's working. All right, so uh, I'm Kevin Newkirk, like Jim said. Uh, I worked on Borderlands uh, as a technical artist. Uh, this is Jim Sanders. Uh, as you see, there we are. So uh, let's start with. Uh, There, there's supposed to be a video, I promise. All right. So here's some of the glory that the Borderlands do. Liquids and everything moving around, 
That's actually what we're talking about. But I wanted to let you guys know that some people don't realize that GPU accelerated effects isn't the standard, it's not the norm. And it, it may not be the most cutting edge technology in the world, but making it work in a system where you can spawn anything, there's no way for us to test. We can't just go and spawn you know, 14 million weapons and then back on and see it works. So the fact that we were able to come to a solution where you can spawn all these things on top of each other, and sometimes designers will spawn in weird effects. I'll make something for a, a scag of a breath attack. And I'll play the game and like, there's a totally different creature with this breath attack. It'd be like a bandit. And I'm like, what? But that's how it works. So anyhow, next slide. Next slide. Okay, so some of the effects that we put in, and, and all these were shown in the video, um, we had persistent mesh debris. Um, a lot of this came from impact effects from your weapons, uh, particles shooting up out of the ground. These would all lay on the ground basically forever. So anytime another effect played, those previous effects would now interact again. And, and what you have with, with most console games is uh, you play an effect, it plays, it's done and it's over. It doesn't have any interaction ever again. So, so what we got with, with physics is when these effects appear in the game, they're there. And, and anytime you do a new effect, say a force field, it's going to interact with the effects that are already there. Uh, so that's one of the big bonuses you get with physics and these GPU effects. Um, so like I said, we had mesh debris, uh, force fields, SPH fluid, which is like the blood, uh, the corrosive effects when that guy vomited out all that awesome green goo. Um, and then there was uh, cloth effects as well. Um, and the, really the coolest thing about this is most of the, these effects are available in stock UDK. So anybody who downloads UDK off the internet has access to most of these effects. So it's, we didn't have to do a lot to implement these into um, Gearbox's modified UV3. And just because we like videos so much, we're gonna show you another We have lots of videos, but so if you guys are zoning out, it's totally cool. about how this would all work out. 
we wanted to do dynamic carrying the cloth, and that's something that is just not possible in traditional effects. We do a lot of vertex animation that we'll talk about later. But adding physics is, is really something I think that you have to commit to in the sense that you're adding a new character. And part of the reason we want to push this route is I truly believe that's where games are going. Um, for those of you who may not be gamers, um, having that edge, I think, is really important to us. We want our team, our effects artists, to be able to understand what GPU accelerated physics can add. It's a character. It's another living entity. It's something that brings a different dimension to your game. But not, I don't want to sell it down. I'm trying to sell you guys some video products or something. And I'm not a salesman either. But I do want to say that it's something that hopefully everyone will have a chance to look at. Because it's pretty darn cool. I mean, there's tons of videos online you should look at. They have lots of examples. And this is just a start. This is a scratch. There's so many great games out there that feature this that you should look at. But we wanted to also do something that doesn't impact the game in a negative way. We don't want to explode a wall. It falls over and you can't finish your, your side mission. So the whole premise of Borderlands is that we want to make something that's fun. It's entertainment, but we want to add immersion. So there's a balance between making something that's cool and making something that just is so cool with Wednesday. So that was one of our early kind of apprehensions that we had. Like, how does this all come together in a way that still feels like Borderlands? Not too hyper-realistic, somewhat stylized, but all kind of just works together. And we just said, let's take the jump. Let's do it. And we first saw it in the early sense, we were like, holy cow, this is so cool. We gotta, we gotta keep on moving. But anyhow, I could probably just talk more about that process better. So, um, I'm Jeff Lee. There's a lot of things to consider when, when adding phys -ex. Um This is this is all, um, it's all PC based. This is not console. So it opens the door to, to a lot of things you can't do on the console. But you're still limited by, by memory and performance. So, um, although you would like to have a million particles on the screen at one time, it's not always feasible. So, memory and performance do have an impact. Uh, and, and like Jim had said, you, what, what impact is this actually going to have on the development style? Is it, is it going to fit the game? And, and it fit, and it worked. It worked really well in Borderlands. Um, and then they have this, this very custom engine, which we, we've, in, in the beginning, we were wondering if there was going to have to be a lot of work to make sure all these effects worked. Luckily, we didn't. Uh, all the changes they made into the engine didn't, didn't do a lot to the physics SDK that's already inside of, of UE3. That was probably one of our biggest fears, is we have a, a whole new suite of tools that we use as completely proprietary that allows us to access virtually any bit of script or code in the game in a very user-friendly design way. And we're really terrified that you know you could somehow the designer could hook up a weapon that could spawn 50 shots, that could all spawn 50 corrosive effects that would have impacts and other secondary explosion effects. And suddenly we got 15 billion physics particles on screen and just crush as any computer and then we have angry people in forums you know, hating on us. So it was interesting, we're like, how do we make this work in this pipeline still do what we want to do without you know admitting to doing something to our code base that might break it? Or us trying to be something that might break it. And I, I guess it probably can't talk too much about it, but I can say that uh, the video was really awesome helping us solve problems real quickly. But you get stuck on how do I do this particle system or how do we get this to trigger? I guess you know, I can give you guys a call and even answer it real quickly. That's pretty, pretty cool. All right, so let's, uh, let's actually look at the effects that we put in. And again, Scale it, meaning that we could have different physics level on the PC. We could 
feedback for consoles so we don't kill the console performance. We really can't do this. Critical to us that we accomplish all of our design goals, our visual aesthetic targets, and still be able to have a game that people can play without worrying about performing it. Okay, go. So the texture and the and so on. And as you can see from, from these two videos, is there was a pretty significant difference from the, the physics particles added in to what you would see on a console. So, one of the benefits, like I had said earlier, that you get with physics is you get persistent debris. Um, like I said, this, this adds another layer of interaction. You know? As he was shooting ground, he left debris all over it. And as soon as he throws a grenade, which is a totally separate effect, you get interaction with the debris that was already on the ground. And then you saw from the console version, when, when he was shooting the ground, there's no debris left. There's no interaction between effects. And that's something that physics, physics allow you, and it's, it's really pretty cool. Now when you're, you're doing these persistent particles, there are some very important things that you have to consider. Lighting being one of them. Um, all of the mesh debris is lit. Now, this could cause problems if you don't have shadows as well. And as you can see on the left, we have particles lit, but they don't receive any shadows, and it looks really bad. But on the right, these particles are lit, and they actually receive shadows and cast them. So now the particles, they look bright. They are receiving the light properly, so when they're in a dark spot, they darken, and when they're in the light, they're nice and bright. And to make this more challenging, um, we actually have a time of day in Borderlands 2. So if you play the game, you'll see that it'll transition from a day to a night, and there's actually a, a dynamic light that will change colors and intensity throughout the day. But not only do they have to receive light, we did reflect that color and that range. And there was a, obviously some hiccups that we had throughout the development cycle to get that just right, but eventually we know that. Also with lighting, or also with particles, is collision is very important. Now, for gameplay, collision isn't as important. If you have a drum, you don't need to have a perfect cylinder for collision. You can just use a box, because you're not going to notice as the player if the character is not walking around smoothly. Well, for persistent particles and debris, if, if this rock just had a box as a collision shape, all those particles would be floating in midair. So how we got around this is we actually used triangle collision. So all the meshes in the world, the particles are using the actual geometry as collision. Um, now this is only the particles that is using geometry. The actual character still uses the uh, the simple collisions. So this was this was this triangle collision was put in specifically for the particles, so that when you shot a big rock and they came to rest on a rock underneath it, it would actually look like they're laying on top of the rock. What's really huge about this that you may be understanding some is we, Borderlands 2 was super ambitious. We had to cut kilobytes of data just to get this to work on the consoles. One of our optimization passes were, was to reduce physics memory. Part of the physics memory is collision. So all the collision that we have in our game, we custom make. So everything is very basic. We wanted to keep that performance optimization on the consoles. So we didn't want to enable for quality collision across all the platforms because we're going to eat that physics overhead. So NVIDIA actually came up with a solution to make her quality collision function on PC only, but not on the consoles. That was huge, and that's really what helped us achieve this particular goal. All right, so now let's, let's see what we did with the cloth. things, the biggest benefits for having cloth is it's fully interactive. As the player shoots it, you can see he's putting holes in the cloth. He's tearing it up. He just destroyed that target by shooting it a few times. Now this is something that, that you can only do with NVIDIA's physics cloth. And you can watch it. He, he walks into it and he's pushing it away. There's full interaction between the player and the cloth. And then he throws a grenade and it creates force field. And that force field interacts with the cloth as well. 
with traditional sparks, sprite based targeting systems, um, there's no way that we can create this type of interactivity. It's, this is the solution that we've wanted for a long time, we wanted in the first game, and we just couldn't do it. So it's really exciting to see this. If you do vertex based animation on the cloth, for example, when you shoot it, he decals those things. So we couldn't use decals on the cloth. We couldn't put the whole integration in it without adding some custom tech for that. So this is our old solution. This is a material expression that we put together that uses a, it's basically a vertex world position offset and allows us to control the X, Y, and Z axis to fake movement of the clock by physically offsetting the mesh geometry in the world. It's pretty cool, and it works out right, but it doesn't tear, it doesn't really accomplish what we want it to accomplish. And you can see it's a little bit unwieldy. It's really not as complicated as Unreal Life. What well, am I saying? You guys are like all scientists here, right? But uh, it's actually pretty simple. It's how it's actually working. Out of curiosity, are there any researchers here or academic scholars? That's really cool. So with, with simulated cloth, there are there are um, good things and bad. It it does cost to simulate it. It's not free. Uh, particles are very cheap. Um, you can put hundreds of thousands of them on the screen and get very little impact on your GPU. Cloth, on the other hand, cloth is a little bit more expensive. It takes up a little bit more uh, power. And there's other considerations. You have to. You have to look at how how it's going to interact in the game world. Uh, you want to make sure that it doesn't it doesn't hamper the game at all or get in the way. Um, you don't want a big target hanging in front of something that the player actually needs to interact with and hide it. Um, and you know, one of the benefits is it, it looks it looks better. Um, Once we showed this off to the development team at Gearbox, and he just got everybody's head spinning, and now there's requests they want to close they want. Some type of you know attachment for a character. They want to turn it into metal so you can get like some type of procedural dent uh, look and feel to it. They want to turn it into walls. They want to make whole rooms of cloth. So I just want to say thank you for all that short sure coming on the show. <laughs> and one of the biggest benefits is you get tearing. Um, if you've ever played a video game and you've shot a piece of cloth, it never does anything. Well, with physics, you can shoot something and it'll tear and it looks awesome. So, real quickly, uh, let me go through the authoring process. I won't spend much time. Um, making the cloth is actually very, very simple. Uh, on the left, you see the base mesh that we got from Gearbox. Um, all we did, too, was tessellate it a bit. There's really nothing more to it. We add, added a few more polish to it, and then we had to rig it. Um, basically, it's a three-bone system. There's one bone for the uh, for all the vertices that will never move. Uh, basically, these are our pin points. These are the points on, on this talk that are going to pin it into the world. Um, you have a bone for just cloth. Uh, these, this basically is going to be the pieces that will be left over uh, in case you destroy the whole thing. Uh, and in this image, those would be the corners. Um, when, you, when you would shoot this tarp up, no matter what, you could destroy everything but these corners. And that would just give you the idea that, that it was there before and it's not totally gone. Uh, and then the rest is all for the tearing, and as you can see, the majority of the actual cloth is for tearing because tearing is cool. Now let's move on to the fluid. We got incoming! <laughs>
actually playing phys x particles on top of our existing particle effects. And it's pretty seamless. You can't really tell where one starts and one stops. I 
moves the gym bug rust on those. But one of the things that we have to have is multiple fluid colors, types, and surfaces. We want to be able to support blood and corrosion at the same time. And originally we were like, yeah, we can only do one type. I'm like, well, I'm afraid we really can't do that. It's going to look really weird if suddenly there's blood and then there's corrosion. We've got to have both of those things at the same time. And the video is like, oh, pray there's gym again. And it really came in pretty late in the dev cycle. And I'm starting to wonder if we're actually going to get this done. So we did finally support multiple fluids per screen, like the screen shows. And what that allows us to do is all types of really cool, different types of situations where there might be, you know, some guy dissolving, like in this picture. Then you have this blood pool that's splattering over here. Then you can have a grenade that can just blow all this up all over the place. So, Fluids are, are fairly expensive. I mean, yes, we can do 25,000 particles, but rendering 25,000 particles is not the easiest thing in the world. So one way we got around that was with downsampling. Um, downsampling is basically taking the resolution and we chopped it in half. Um, the problem with downsampling is it creates all kinds of you know, nice little jaggies, which no one really wants to see in their game. Uh, how we got around this, was using um, FXAA. And what this is, is this is the fax approximate anti-aliasing algorithm that was created by some here at NVIDIA, um, and the script was named, and he just told me it, Timothy Lotes. He's talking next, you can tell him that he's saying very bad. Um, so, so what this actually does is instead of, instead of working on the actual geometry, it works on the pixels instead. So instead of having all these really ugly jaggies with FXAA, we get really smooth, really nice looking fluids that are downsampled, but you can't tell. Very nice, very cool. Now, to actually make the fluid is, there's really not a lot of parameters you need to actually to worry about for the actual uh, simulation. Um, we get three parameters. I can't really read them, sorry. Um, but it allows you to control and make tons and tons of different types. And a lot of this is actually controlled with simply based on, on, on the density and stuff like that, where you can control color and size. And, and it allows you to make, you know, really thick fluid or kind of oozy, watery, um, but the most important thing is, is it was fairly easy to do. Um, and then the checkbox is probably the most important box uh, to be, when it says suppress for low core. Because we wanted to do multi-region support with Borderlands 2, as opposed to the first Borderlands, which uh, people in Japan had put, people in Australia, or so on. We wanted to allow different communities to play together. So what that little checkbox does is say, hey, if this region doesn't dig lots of core and why don't play it. It's, it's really sad for me as a fact that I really like core, but uh, we got to do is what we got to do to make sure all of our friends around the world can play. Now one of the issues we actually had was with sorting. Um, might be hard to tell, but this, this little black hole in the middle, that's actually a doorway that bad guys come out of. And what you're missing is the entire explosion of the fluid in front of that. Um, and that, that's basically a, a sorting order. The, the doorway is being sorted in front of the fluid. And those are some of the kind of things that we had to, we had to work with, was where is the fluid rendered? What's the order of it? Um, and this, we you know, Gearbox was awesome. You'd come back and it was like, um, your door is rendering in front of the fluid, and they'd be like, oh, well, let's see what we can do about that. And, and you know, they're super awesome human guys. They, whenever we'd come back with a problem like this and say, Fluid looks awesome. I say it does. Well, let's see what we can do to fix that sorting order. And, and you know, every time we came back to them with something like this, they were always willing to to look at the problem and find the best solution. So to simulate or not to simulate? The I kind of covered a little bit of this already, but we wanted to make sure that we could do a lot of different things with uh, blood and gore. And the thing about liquids in general is that's something that people see all the time. 
and people are really picky about it. So if you have blood that's too red, it's like, hey, that blood is too fresh. It should be browner blood or darker blood. So there's all these different looks and feels. Plus, we have a dozen different traditional blood effects we need already. All that had to kind of, um, I guess, work really well together. Like, for instance, it's like that big blood puddle. Should that be a decal? Or should it be this cool puddle of blood? So there's a lot of decisions that we had to make. We also had to decide, hey, how much can we get away with before we get censored or refill our certification process? There's different rules for different regions. Some regions are okay with tons of, of blood and gore, but the second there's like one little bone fragment, you're done. And you have to basically rip it out. So eventually we were able to kind of, uh, I guess, discuss the, the lowest risk route, which is what we ended up with. And that's, uh, that was Borderlands 2. Uh, any questions? <coughs> Lots of questions? Everybody too scared to ask a question? Um, yeah. I can give you the mic. I can give you the mic. This is probably not a tech question per se, but uh, I would like for you guys to develop the, um, the history of how Borderlands, especially the first one, became something completely different from what it started to be. Which one were you hoping to see? The original original? Or the... I never saw the original, so... Well, I happen to have been the art team lead on the project. I know, that's why I'm asking. So I would like to know, like, your opinion, what Randy said, at what moment you guys decided to change the art direction into a soul shape kind of game, which is awesome. I'm pretty sure if you look on uh, Google, you'll find like five different ways this happened. I'm going to tell you another one. Uh, at the time, we were looking at what we had created. We wanted something that was hyper-realistic, had this kind of stylization, but it wasn't, wasn't working for us, or something that just wasn't connecting. So we started to experiment with a different aesthetic look, a different art direction for the project. And we had a couple guys in the team that were playing around with some old-school mod techniques about inverting uh, normals, actually spawning two meshes inside of each other to create like an outline. I'm like, hey, that, that's kind of cool. At the same time, we're, we're crunching. We're working really hard to try to get this game done. We're trying to deliver a product that we'll be really proud of. And when we're looking at our staff, our account that we have around it, we obviously want the people in a role that they're best suited to, that they're most talented at doing. And it turned out we had two actual comic artists on our team, like that that paid books for like you know Batman and stuff. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me! What are you doing? It's like, oh, I'm an icon guy. Make an icon for the interface. It's like, oh, no, no, dude, that's crazy. You gotta get your painting stuff. Can you paint some textures? It's like, oh, I don't know anything about Max. So we set him up and he did some, some texture painting. Like, oh my god, this is killer. So that just got the wheels just kind of moving. And we had some code that came in to give us like a base outline sheet, and then we hand paint all the um, texture on top of that. And Borderlands 2 is kind of like the evolution of that. We finally got our kind of our uh, direction and how we want to paint our textures, our, our process and pipeline down fairly well now. But uh, here's a, a fun little trivia fact for you. If you go back and play the first game, we didn't paint everything. We didn't have time. We only hand painted probably 50 to 60 percent of all the assets, but no one ever knows. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Thank you so much. That's really interesting. And congratulations on the World Wars too. Thank you. Yeah, it's awesome. Good. Anybody else? Any questions? The textures are like comic books style, but how do you generate the outline? So for example, on the top of the toilet, there's this back outline. There is an outline sheet here uh, that, that's actually applied. We experimented originally with creating a pure um, material-based solution. We can create like a uh, post-process effect that would render full screen on top of it and draw an outline of different things based on uh, distance and so on. And it turned out to be really expensive. So we turned it over to some of our graphics coders, and they're like, hey, I think we can hard code this much cheaper. So this, this is actually now a part of our like, render pipeline through our process that will actually apply the outline on it. I wish I knew you guys asked these questions. I could have brought you some screenshots of everything just gray with the outline so you can see how it works. I don't want to give away all the secrets, right? <laughs> OK, so about the secrets, um, you <laughs> developed a lot of stuff. And did it become part of the open source uh, engine, or well, did you contribute back? Oh, you mean it was a part of uh, Unreal 3, or was it proprietary? Unreal, yeah, the Unreal 3. That's something added to it. 
but it, it's not something that's difficult to add. A lot of people, you'll see other games, a lot of indie games that are creating their own kind of outline shaders. You can find dozens of examples of just shaders on the internet that you can make and build right now in Unreal 3 and pretty much replicate this exact look. When can we expect Borderlands 3? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we, we talk about Borderlands 3 all the time. It's something that's very close to our hearts. We're all very passionate and excited about it. And we don't have a date yet. Um, we know we want to, we want, we're going to make another one. We know that for sure. And, and that's kind of what Big Stan, right? That's correct. And that's that's kind of what part of the process why we don't have a definitive answer is we want to make more Borderlands content. We don't want to wait until next gen comes out. But at the same time, we do, because, man, this is going to be awesome what we can do with this, this new console. And things going to be so much more part of each other that we can make some really killer you know, visual effects, uh, killer art for it. Everything can just go to a whole other level. But do we do, we do that, or do we make something new in the meanwhile? I can tell you we're making something in the meanwhile that's going to be killer. You guys are going to really like it if you're, if you're fans of the franchise. If you're not, you should try it out. Grab your buddy, go play some games. It's fun. Anyone else? Okay. And, and you can tell we're not like professional speakers. We kind of suck at this. So thanks for being nice to us today. So it seems like you have two very different visual engines here. Like for the console, you got a cut of a lot of effects, but for the PC, you have a bunch of awesome effects like the physics stuff here. And I wonder, from like an art direction, do you, does that constrain you because you're, you're maybe making effects that only the PC people will see, but you want to make something that's still awesome? I don't really know how to phrase this as a question, but are you, are you somewhat constrained because you, you have to make the, the least common denominator? That, that's a good question. I was kind of hoping to ask that because it's tough to accept the answer. Uh, the, that was actually one of our original concerns with adding physics. That is, hey, we're going to have all this really cool stuff on the PC. But what about the consoles? We really, really try hard to make all platforms look and play the same. So that was actually a big bullet point. When we were talking and bidding back and forth and internally if we're going to add this or not, is it can be cool, it can look awesome, but it can't affect game design, gameplay, or function in any way. So on the other hand, is from a, like an art direction point of view, is this going to clash? Is this not going to be consistent enough with the other platforms? Are we, are we adding too much? Are we taking stuff away? And basically we decided uh, we're going to go ahead and do this for the PC for a couple reasons. Because we believe in the future, when we have uh, the next gen consoles uh, coming out, this will be on the consoles, and this will happen. We need to start learning and understanding this tech right now, because we don't want to have to have a steep learning curve or something as we're going into the next gen consoles, and we want, want to give this to everybody. So, anyway, emotionally we're torn, but we decided to do it anyway. <laughs> We had to take deliberate care with how we placed cloth for exactly that reason. Borderlands doesn't feature like competitive multiplayer component like in some other shooters, so it's not that big of a deal. So there's some areas maybe where there's some cloth that might be hiding a bandit that comes out and kills you and might really tick you off. Sorry, I guess. So. <laughs> we tried to fix those, we use those as we could. Thank you. Anybody else? At least a day or two, I think. Yeah, maybe a day, maybe two days, maybe three days. I think Dane was sick on one day, so. Do you think it's okay for me to spill like a secret how that whole process worked? Uh, depends on how big the secret is. <laughs> <laughs> so another part of this process was um, we wanted to add physics to the game, but I have a team of effects guys making traditional effects, um, you know, parallel. So how do you fix that pipeline? So what we actually do is we spawn a particle system, traditional sprites, and that links to a physics system. It's, it's equivalent in every way, except it has physics emitters. Then we dynamically say, hey, this is a PC, turn it on. Or, hey, this is a console, don't turn it on, and we cook all this stuff out, so it's not on this. So, I think that might kind of hint a little bit about that. There's a lot more that kind of went on, but if you were to think of maybe 2,500 particle systems uh, that were 
traditional. We didn't do that every single physics equivalent. But I would say every one of those partial systems would take a, a day to a week, depending on how analog was being about a particular area. Oh, like if, if you want to add physics to your game, how, how does it impact your development cycle? Yeah. Yeah, I, would, I wouldn't say it's that, but it really wouldn't be that bad. I mean, I don't really think of it quite the same way, because you're making traditional effects at the same time. But if I were to say you're going to add a physics equivalent to every single particle system that you create a game that is particle intensive, like Borderlands 2, which is super heavy with particles, you're probably talking an extra 20% of dev time, or you should probably ramp up with an extra uh, team member. That would give you a little extra time to be smart and deeper. Any other questions? Yes. Do you have any shift codes you can share? <laughs> you want to some golden key? Those well, questions. <laughs> yeah. um, I might be able to look you guys up. If you, uh, if honestly, if you'd like some codes or something, uh, come to me after the, the presentation. I'll grab you guys business cards or whatever. I'll, I'll take care of you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, fortunately, we're not you know, we're doing the same presentation at GDC. There's probably like 500 people, so we might not do the same thing there. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, well, uh, thanks, guys. <laughs>